I'll say it again. Hello, Emma Hotep, and welcome. I'm Mog Morgan. I'm going to speak to you about tarot. In fact, the title of a talk, Transformational Images in the Tarot, Evidence of Their Origins in Ancient Egyptian Image Magic. Now, ancient Egypt is uh, an intellectual and spiritual world that is linked to our own by numerous uh, strands of tradition. That's a quote from the famous Egyptologist Jan Asman, which kind of says it all, really. We're connected, even if we don't know it, <laughs> we are. Okay, so we're talking about uh, evidence of the origins of the tarot deck in the ancient world. Uh, and scholarly opinion is of, of the opinion that the tarot cards are actually no earlier than the Italian Renaissance. And uh, the cartomantic deck, which is the one that's used for tarot readings and divinations these days, is even more modern, really, probably not more than about 200 years uh, old, right, in terms of development, the use of playing cards and cards, so it's said, uh, for divination. And that stems from the Napoleonic era, uh, the, which means Napoleon's conquest of Egypt, which was a, a kind of renaissance of its, of its own, really, in terms of knowledge of Egypt, sort of, uh, of the hieroglyphs, translation of the hieroglyphs. He took a whole scientific team with him to Egypt, and, and that kind of changed Western culture, really, gave it a kind of whole aesthetic. Gave it lots of new ideas in terms of furniture, everything, culture, clothing, everything. Anyway, the hypothesis of an Egyptian provenance for the tarot, tarot this is a quote, all right, can be discounted. The idea of an Egyptian origin of the tarot, an old one, can be discounted on several grounds, according to this quote. First, that the, the ancient Egyptians did not have paper or cardboard in which to construct tarot cards uh, that's an argument i suppose but even though the origins of the tarot deck itself right can be traced to the italian court the visconti court of milan it's progenet data the regular play it comes right from the regular playing card deck and that paradoxically the regular playing card deck can be traced to ancient Egypt according to the same scholar so it's a little bit contradictory and the evidence the reason they say that this thing about them not having a paper and cardboard doesn't seem a very substantial reason I think that, that usually the, the main reason is that when you look at the tarot deck supposedly um, the original one anyway from the renaissance that there isn't a lot of evidence or a lot of examples of of egyptian imagery and iconography in the cards themselves they don't seem to show that so it's said that was scholarly opinion which of course in what i'm going to say i'm going to i'm going to stretch that a little bit if not over completely overturn it but first I, we've got we've got to understand what people believe this is this was thought to be a settled issue <laughs> in a way but i don't think it is settled really Primarily, from the esoteric point of view, there's this, this story that kind of goes the rounds from uh, various people. Probably someone called Cagliostro started it off. Uh, and he said that he came out with this story. He was a kind of European adept in the Napoleonic era who said that when people were initiated into the mysteries in the ancient world uh, in, and into the magical tradition, they were taken to the pyramids uh, and there was a secret entrance into the pyramids and they went down one of these great galleries within the, the pyramids and there were a series of 11 images on either side of the corridor or gallery as they went in, 11 on each side. and which makes 22, and therefore those 22 images, he said, Cagliostro, they are pretty much identical with the major Trump images of the tarot. Uh, so that's 200 years ago. It comes up with an idea, a very, very nice idea. Um, it's not really possible to... It's not really possible to to prove that, right? That doesn't, or, or if you like, 
various uh, people, various historians of the Tarot have tried to um, track that story down, right? See if it's got any basis in this historical record. And so far, th they, they can't really find it. And it, it does sound a little bit garbled and a little bit too good to be true in a way. Although it has to be said, the idea of the a link series of images within the Egyptian tombs or temples is absolutely feasible. I mean, that's exactly what you do get if you go to Egypt. You do see a schema, a story being told in a series of tableaus um, that lead people that, that on a particular journey, that tell a particular story, and that is very like the tarot. But the, the particular idea of the 22 images, that's, that's never been tracked down. Now, it was usually thought that Cagliostro probably kind of made that up, basically, or it was just, you know, yeah, probably made him, yeah, made it up. Why not say that? But from some of the research I've done for this paper, for this uh, uh, presentation, I think I'm, I'm specifically one of the things I'm going to talk about at the end, if I get that far, <laughs> is that... The story, maybe Cagliostro didn't make that up. Maybe it was a story that he, he, he learned from the Arab tradition. Because within the uh, tradition of the Islamic intellectual tradition, the idea that there was a particular temple in ancient Egypt, not necessarily the py pyramids, but a particular temple that told the story of what's known as the Hermetic tradition uh, through pictures on the wall of the temple with, in which... Uh, initiates and adepts if you like people being initiated into the mysteries were shown these image in a particular sequence and it told the story of the egyptian god um, hermes or thoth as the egyptians would call it it told all of the, the mysteries this place did exist in a place called akmin in uh in egypt uh, and according to the islamic tradition or uh, the arabic speaking tradition this was this place existed. So I think Cagliostro might it just might have heard that. I think some of the things, the, the rediscovery, if you like, of the esoteric tradition within the Islamic uh, world is, is, is probably quite a modern thing, really. Uh, or, or certainly it's taken on a... It's, it's come forward in, in leaps and bounds, really. And this particular text we're going to uh, talk about at the end, which is so startling in a way, is going to be amazing. Uh, this text is one that's only been translated very recently. So in a sense, people who were trying to find the history of the tarot, maybe they should have looked a little bit wider outside of the sort of purely Western tradition. Of course, having said that, there are some cards within the tarot sequence where you can actually uh, trace an Egyptian origin for them in terms of the, the, the iconography, the images themselves. Just one, one or two. Obviously images, the conventions of art tend to sort of change over time. But one of the, uh, the images that is very, very interesting is an image of uh, Nemesis Pet B, Nemesis being the goddess uh, or god of fate. Pet B meaning soul of the sky. So it's a particular type of the goddess ne uh, Nemesis that, that was worshipped was very popular in an area called Akmin. And Akmin uh, it comes up a lot in this story. A lot of stuff obviously happened there. I'll just mention that there was a temple there that told these stories in pictures. Uh, now we discover that in the area there's this image of ne ne uh, Nemesis. And if you look at the image, you'll see it's a griffin holding a wheel. Now, if you look at the Wheel of Fortune card in almost any tarot deck, uh, and, and the Wheel of Fortune is one of the more important of the, the, the decks, uh, of the cards within the tarot sequence, it's kind of central. It is the wheel on which the whole thing revolves. Then you'll see that you have the Wheel of Fortune and you have a, a griffin uh, on top of it. So it's it's almost a direct, you know, quote of the the old image, really, of the Wheel of Fortune. The similar thing can be done with a moon card. 
you know, research has just got better, really. So all these things are coming out. The moon card in the tarot sequence seems to be almost identical to an amulet from uh, Egypt, which is to do with uh, repelling the evil eye, which is a very common form of magic within the Middle East, and especially in Egypt, which is a kind of center of it really it's all, all uh, so much magic to do with the evil eye comes from that area from our very old so that's at least two of the cards are easy to track down to egypt i would have thought um so you can't really say there's no uh egyptian iconography it's just you have to look in a certain way and it is there the other thing people notice about the tarot is that the sort of views the backgrounds of the tarot uh, behind the figures, the general sort of looks, are, they're, they're often these great desert landscapes, these vistas across the desert, uh, landscapes that don't really look European at all. They look very uh, Near Eastern. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can almost recognize certain places like the Oasis of Siwa that's that's in, in, in the background of, of the tarot. So people have noticed this before, that the general colour scheme and the, the landscapes in the background don't look European at all. And that's that's not a coincidence, I don't think. So I've kind of thought that maybe the previous people who looked at this issue, maybe they were asking the wrong questions, really, which is why they got the answers they did. They focused too much on the physical uh, artifact of the tarot, the um, the card aspect to it, if you like, and it, it kind of they don't really think about what is uh, the tarot in itself. What is the essence of the tarot? Uh, when I was kind of researching this thing, funny enough, in a dream, I came up with this idea of transformational images. That the tarot are a series of transformational images really so for, which could assist in any way they can they can they could be just descriptions they can be pictures they could be on cards but essentially you've got a series of transformational image images that if you look at them or meditate upon them or dream upon them which is what i did or whatever then they kind of take you on this journey this this sequence they take to eventually to some sort of psychophysical rebirth and the, on the way you go through all these various experiences and you see various important things and you go through usually there's a kind of an ordeal in the center a kind of resurrect what they call a resurrection chamber of some sort where you're kind of taken apart and put back together again um, which has this rather great name the other resurrection chamber and that is that is what the tarot does, right? Even now, even without the kind of knowing that. And that is how I'm going to kind of approach it, really. That that's what it does. Okay, so, so starting again with to look at the image, look at this issue of, of where the sequence comes from. So I'll start again without worrying too much about. Uh, previous theories and orthodoxy and it's rather startling in fact to emerge right it's almost like a joke really <laughs> at first it's kind of funny looking up cards in general then playing cards uh, and first thing pops in my head the most popular card game in europe before poker is a game called feral and feral I thought, God, no, right, it can't be. Yeah, but it is. Pharaoh, the game of Pharaoh is named after the Egyptian Pharaoh. So we're talking about a game that's been played for hundreds of years by gamblers, especially in the French uh, court of uh, 16th century, 17th century and all, all, all the rest of it. This was the, the, the gambling game that they played. And I thought, God, I wonder why they called it Pharaoh. You know, maybe whatever. So I looked it up in various sort of uh, histor historical sort of books on play on gambling really and they said the reason it was called feral is because the array of of cards the kings 
all the kings in the in in the normal playing card deck have Egyptian elements to them. So I but they didn't say what they what they were. Um, so I looked at these old card decks, you know, stuff so, so whatever from hundreds of years ago, and. You know, I looked and looked, and I couldn't really find anything that like they weren't sort of there in the normal Egyptian form. So, but if you look at the names of the of the kings, uh, the the four main kings in the in the playing card deck. If you get a pl normal playing card deck, you might see this: are Caesar, Charlemagne, who was the kind of most famous king within Europe, um, Alexander, and king david so those are the four archetypal kings so i kind of think that really a pharaoh was what was slang was slang for king really uh, because look caesar has a link with caesar becomes caesar really because of egypt uh or whatever but certainly alexander although it's not kind of maybe it doesn't completely jump out at you unless you know a little bit about the history in a way alexander the great is the most famous of all the egyptian uh, pharaohs maybe maybe ramesses the second might be equal but alexander really that's his thing right he's um he's the man and you you see this <clears throat> if you go back to what is a wonderful deck to look at if you're interested <coughs> in the inter in the history of the tarot is to look at the uh, deck called the Solar Busca deck, uh, which was has an interesting history which I can't go into now, but it's a kind of Renaissance masterpiece. Really, it's a beautiful deck. Quite hard to get into from if you're in, if you know anything about uh, esoteric tarot because it's 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 a little bit different and and strange. But one of the things that you note about the, the solar busca, if you look, if you get a hold of a copy, is that it has this sequence of, of four cards. Now, from an esoteric point of view, this idea of a sequence of four anyway, a progression like uh, mother, father, son, daughter, it's kind of like a Jungian set of archetypes, really. You know, it's like, it's infinite. And you find these kind of fourfold patterns within <coughs> with it within the solar busker as well so you've got a card alexander as we just said and as you see from the card alexander is shown with griffins which are again we saw the griffins with the wheel of fortune the griffin which is this kind of dr wing dragon type figure that's a that's a very quintessential egyptian image it really is right if you look into it that that the you know if you think griffins you go to the temples of egypt you'll see griffins all the time and that's a very very interesting story in its own right he's shown in the desert landscape with his chariot drawn by two griffins so there's alexander uh, next to him is the next part is the queen so you've got the king alexander his queen is shown as Olympia, you can, you probably miss these things. You look at it, who's that? Olympia was Alexander the Great's mother. Uh, now, the strange thing about that, and, and then the, the, I should say the other card is Nectanable, Nectanable, and then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the the punchline of this. The strange thing is that that what this is referring us to is a thing called the Alexander Romance. And the story of Alexander, uh, in a way, and this is all about Egypt. You've got this situation where Egypt, before the coming of the Greeks and, uh, and, and Alexander, was struggling, right, with its violent neighbours, notably Persia, the Syrian Empire and all the rest. And it fought a number of wars over a long time, sometimes it won. But basically, the last native uh, Egyptian pharaoh was Nectanable. And Nectanable was a magician, very, very uh, big creator of images, uh, of uh, astrological images, of magical images. He was a magician pharaoh. He was a pharaoh, but he used a lot of magic to fight for his country. He used battle magic, 
astrological magic, symbolic magic, to try and halt, halt the invasion of this very, very powerful neighbor. And with some success, it has to be said, there, there are some notable successes in this magic. But in the end, the writing was on the wall and uh, he was defeated. He was defeated in the Battle of Memphis and luckily he managed to escape the battlefield and went to Nubia and that's the last one hears of him. That is what happened historically. That's what happened. But there's this story, and there's a little bit of extra story because you think, well, well, we'd like to know what happened to Nectanebo. He's such, a, such an interesting character. Uh, so someone obviously thought that. I said, well, let, let's work out what happened to Nectanebo after he, the Persians came and he lost the war and they took over. What happened to him? So he had these skills. He was good at astrology. He was good at magic. He was good at symbolism and painting and all the rest. So he went to Macedonia, not Nubia. And he got a job with the court of uh, Alexander, basically, or Alexander's Philip of Macedon. And, he, and Philip of Macedon's wife was Olympia, who was Alexander the Great's mother. And classical sources say that Olympia, Olympia was a member of a, a static religious cult in the ancient world, which practiced uh, religious orgies and a static religion, uh, out, altered states, if you like. Nectanebo gets a, a, a job as a magical practitioner, and not telling them he's got this uh, aristocratic background. And eventually, in one of these rituals, Alexander is conceived. Right, so in a sense, and Alexander, famously in the ancient world, Alexander doesn't really look like his father. Right. Uh, but he probably, you know, it, this is legend, right? His father was a great warrior and great leader as well. But there was always this doubt about his paternity because he didn't really look like his father. He was much fairer than his father and all this sort of stuff. Whatever. That's myth, if you like. That's romance, as they say, or some sort of history. Eventually, Alexander became this kind of amazing uh, ruler, warrior, conquered all of the known world and eventually liberated uh, Egypt uh, from the Persians uh, or conquered Egypt, if you prefer, uh, which is the beginning of the Greek period in uh, Egyptian history. Now, Alexander was very well trained in esoteric matters and, uh, and all the rest. He was a very educated man as well as an incredible warrior. Uh, he knew right what had happened in Egypt under the Persians, the terrible things that had been done, uh, which you can check for yourself uh, w why people hated the Persians so much, um, w did really feel that it was a liberation. So he didn't want to repeat the same mistakes. He didn't want to trample all over the Egyptian uh, point of view or the Egyptian religion as in the, se in the way that the Persians had done. So he thought, I'll try and find what is the soul of Egypt. And he went to a place called Siwa, uh, which is an oasis. Oasis is interesting because it's often shown as the background of several of the cards. And he consulted a famous oracle there and, uh, and, the, and the priest of the Temple of Amun. And he said, what do you think? You know, wh what do you think of me? Uh, you know, uh, have I got a good heart? Blah, blah, blah. And they said, yeah, you know, maybe they were being political or maybe they were just, they say, you are the son of a divine king. Uh, and in a way, you are the incarnation. Your father, your spiritual father is the Egyptian god Amun-Ra. Now, or Amun. Uh, it just happens, neck to neighbor, if he'd have been as he was an Egyptian pharaoh, would also be the incarnation of the god Amun. So in a way, it's, do they know this secret about Nectanebo? Whatever way, it's a remarkable coincidence that they, they say that. And that, in other words, they accept him. They accept him as, an, as a child of the god of their own god, Amun. Uh, hence, you have these stories. And in the solar busca, deck rather remarkably you have a card Amun 
you actually have a card named after the god Hamun, the uh, Knight of Swords. So there's yet another <laughs> Egyptian image. Whatever way you look at it, if you, even if you don't accept all of that story about Alexander, which is, you should, you've got it actually named. It's actually printed on the card. Amun. This is Amun, the, the Egyptian god Amun. So that's at least three cards we've identified directly as having Egyptian iconography. Um, I should say as well, what's important with this issue? See, we've only got a little way through this. We've already, we've already kind of chipped away at that old uh, thesis about the tarot in Egypt, right? Then we've got a little bit of a way to go and we've got, you know, quite a lot of interesting material to look at. If you, again, if you look at the solar busker, you can see it on, on, uh, online on Wikipedia. You'll notice that there's an awful lot of kings within the sequence, but also they're all dressed in Roman armor, or an awful lot of them are dressed in Roman armor. Uh, which is maybe a misdirection. You think, oh, well, they're Romans then, aren't they? They're made in Italy, they're all Romans. But of course, Roman armor is the... Everybody wears Roman armor in terms of mythology. All the Egyptian deities of the, of the period are, are always depicted wearing Roman armor from, the, from then on. Uh, and there's a very famous image from a, actually from a, from a Coptic Christian um, institution, uh, and it shows the god, even though it's Christian, they still keep some of the Egyptian imagery as well. The, the god Horus, Riding on a horse, just like a Roman equestrian, dressed in all the appropriate armor, spearing a kind of dragon, uh, which is uh, an ancient Egyptian god Apophis. Can you pause a little bit because. Do you want to pause if I come unstuck? The camera is sliding down. All right. That's good. Okay, I think I'm saying. You can tell it's live. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have, uh, we have like 17, and now we have 24. I ask people to ask questions after you finish. All right, then. Uh, put them somewhere. So the Coptic thing, I don't want to go off on a tangent. It's very easy to go on a tangent with this. The, the, the Coptic, another issue, maybe we'll explore it again, of how Coptic imagery from the Coptic church, how that really forms the imagery of the grail, St. George and the dragon. There's the image of it. Uh, in the Roman ar armor, you see these images a lot in Egypt if you go into a Coptic church, but also in Europe, the whole Grail legend, people don't know this too much, right? It actually, a lot of the ideas of the, the Grail and the imagery and all the rest actually comes from Cairo. Um, and even, you know, and that's, that's another story and that's been explored. Okay. So that's us exploring the Solar Busker deck. I'm, I'm sure we're going to have to come back to it a little bit for, um, and you know, it's just one little thread. I think if we went through it, all of the cards, we'd find a lot more Egyptian material we could look at. But that's, that's quite a substantial uh, Egyptian influence already. So the next thing that I looked at is a, is a thing called the... Salon de Messi uh, in Italy. So yeah, we've got to go to Italy uh, as being, this is where the people say the, the tarot cards come from. And obviously you know, they do, right? There's an important, um, the Italian Renaissance. What does Renaissance mean? It's the, it was the center of the revival of the classical world. That's what happened there. Ancient paganism, ancient Egyptian and Greek ideas suddenly re-emerged in the Renaissance. That was the heart of the Renaissance, was this kind of occult philosophy. So obviously the records and the, the things, the cards uh, and the uh, pictures and the amazing artwork uh, Italy is going to be an important center for that. So you, we go to a place called Ferrera, which even in terms of the more traditional views of the history of the tarot, is a very, very important um, place for that. 
location is a pot, pot, pot if you where the tarot may have been invented uh there was a super rich family there called the este family uh, and they built many many wonderful uh houses uh and places to of entertainment which are incredible in their decorations now from, from my point of view the Salon, de, the Salon de Messi, which is the Hall of Months, which is a place that they built for parties, really, for dinners and celebrations of some sort, is decorated with all these tableaus, one for each sign of the zodiac, if you like, one for each month of the year. Uh, an incredible sequence in which you see... Um, you you see a tableau that's it's a huge thing. I mean, you, as I say, you can go and see this online if uh, you can, uh, to see the whole lot. From the floor to the ceiling is a is a tableau for the entire month, but it's in three kind of patterns, three sort of um, layers. The top the top layer is almost like the bright half of the month. The bottom layer is the dark half, the waning moon half of the month, and in the center is a frieze, a kind of band of decoration with three images on it. And that image, those that threefold image, is a thing called the decans. Uh, a decans, not, uh, it's not a very familiar uh, idea to people. It's, it, this may be a new idea to, to a lot of people. It's, it's incredibly important. It's one of these secret things that influences us from from egypt that people have kind of take for granted and they've forgotten about if you study astrology you, you get this idea that uh, each astrological month each sign of the zodiac is divisible into three parts um there's triplicities if you like and that division of the sign of the zodiac into three parts is basically an Egyptian invention that's completely theirs. It's it uh, it's the lasting legacy of, of ancient Egypt, even though it's never mentioned. Uh, it was invented not uh, a very very long time ago in their Middle Kingdom, which is you know thousands of years ago, um, and there are lots of permutations to that. And the decans, you should say to make sense of it, that in the Egyptian. Egyptian working week lasted for 10 days, whereas ours last for seven days, theirs lasted for 10 days. So every month has 30 days, more or less, then so you have three weeks, three decans of 10-day um, day weeks. And, that, and each of those weeks is dominated by a particular spirit connected to the stars in the sky on a kind of uh, circulating uh, cycle. Es essentially, the the decans, I think this is my point of view, but I think I can back it up. The, the decans are like your birth horoscope. They're also your demon. Demon in the classical sense of the word as you, as you might uh, a kind of spirit but it can be demonic as well it can be in some ways kind of horoscopes we, we, they don't necessarily tell you good things they may not the the thing that's uh, if, uh, influencing you at birth could be a little bit demonic in a way you have to know this, right? More, more the purpose of astrology and uh, tarot and the rest is to kind of know what these influences are so you can take precautions, if you, if you like, put it that way. So there are a sequence of demons, and uh, for want of a better word, and hence I've got a kind of book about this, which I call rather dramatically the de demonic calendar, because you can... You can find your birth demon from this, which is an important thing to do. And you can also see this flow of these cosmic tides in the course of the year and the things that you do. And when is a good time to do certain things and when is a bad time. Now, the fascinating thing is that this sequence of demons, and I've been kind of collecting these four versions of this for a long time now, one of the most important versions of the Egyptian decanal system is actually found in this Salon de Messi, the whole of the month in Ferrara in Italy. It's shown there and from analysing the uh, iconography, which is 
takes a bit of time. You can see that the images on it don't look particularly European anyway. But whatever way you look at it, the sequence, why they're there, what they symbolize is uh, separated by a thousand years and with all the things that might happen in that time is completely an Egyptian um, innovation. There in, 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 in astrology, now the thing is about this hall with these, the, these images, these are the origins of the trumps of the tarot. Right. The the images that are on the walls are actually the images that eventually become the trump cards. So they get put on cards. So completely embedded in them is this Egyptian idea of the decans and the images of the decans. And if you're study the tarot in any uh, for any length of time, you you tend to start by looking at only the big picture cards, the main sequence. But after a while, you look at some of the smaller epicycles within the the, uh, the tarot and you discover that the small cards are actually the decans not all of them the cards you've got the the the, the four kings or the four aristocrats the king queen knight and prince if you like or princess sometimes uh, that's those you've got the num uh, the numbered cards between two and ten the aces are not actually numbered right they're, they're actually out on their own four times nine equals 36 which is the number of the decans in an entire uh, annual sequence so the decans are there and there are actually quite interesting interpretations of what the decans might mean in in your tarot but the, whatever way you look at it the de de that's 36 of the cards actually have an egyptian concept embedded within them so that's another card we can mark those on our list we've done the kind of court cards we've done the uh, small cards now i should say as well that you know the sequence of the decans it, it gets disseminated all over the world such a good idea to be honest um such an amazing thing you find versions of the uh the decanal list you'll find them i think you'll find them in the far east even i, I think you'll find them within uh uh chinese astrology uh i think we were looking at this thing the other day i meant to ask him that uh, they talked about the 36 ghosts uh there's a story of the 36 ghosts and i thought 36 same number as the decans uh ghosts like demons you know in our way of looking at it maybe that's a decanal system i haven't had a chance to check that but you can check that for yourself but Certainly, uh, so certainly India, India has some very, very important decanal systems. And in fact, the decanal system of India comes directly from uh, Egypt. Uh, and you can actually see the goddess Isis within their decanal system. It's, it's very, very clear. Their a whole astrological system comes from the Near East anyway. From India, it probably went into the uh, Islamic world, into the Sufi tradition, and through the Islamic world back to the whole of the Islamic world, coming back to uh, all of the Middle East and, and the rest. Different all, all the time, different versions, different variations of the Deccanal system, uh, different languages, Hebrew, Arabic, Latin, through a whole succession till eventually in the renaissance the decanal text was translated from a, a hebrew version in fact uh was translated into italian uh the italian version was translated into english by uh i think william lily it's everywhere and funny enough in modern magic this is also having a kind of a bit of a revival at the moment it's, it's a kind of way of it's a more magical way of looking at the flow of cosmic tides. So the decans are, are everywhere. You can see them in this, as I say, it's funny, how the, this system that comes into Italy ends up in Ferrero, which is for some is said to be the source of the even the normal esoteric tarot deck. Okay. Um, fantastic thing enjoy the pictures i have 
I, I've in, in my book, um, Demonic Calendar Ancient Egypt, um, which is going through various revisions because it doesn't find more material, but it's quite extensive already. Obviously, I started off from the Egyptian system. Nobody had kind of codified or collected all the Egyptian versions of the monuments and of the sequence of demons, but maybe because of the way I am, I kind of particularly interested me. Um, and, and, you know, obviously in a book is, a, is limited. It's sooner or later, <laughs> someone suggested, well, why don't you make them into a set of oracle cards as well? You know, based on the Egyptian one, you use the Egyptian system. And I've kind of been doing that. I, I've only just started doing that, working through the system, uh, as the year progresses, and I've got, I've, I think I've got about two or three um, done. I've got the first one. So the first one is um, is the is the goddess Sirius. In fact, it's the star Sirius. Which you know, you look into the mythology of that, you'll find this is number one Sirius. Why that would start the system? Obviously, the goddess Isis. You say, well, she doesn't seem particularly demonic. I can tell you that she's got a a, a dark side. Right. If you get on the wrong side of her in the ancient world, you had to watch out. Um, she's definitely got a demonic side um, in, in, in this sense. In, in a sense, the Egyptians don't really have a word for demon and they don't make this big distinction between uh, gods and demons that uh, we were kind of used to in, in the Western way of looking at things. Some of the other decanal images are definitely much more uh demonic in their look in fact when i went to one of these i go to egyptian temples researching and photographing uh, astrological monuments and ceilings and collecting them uh the guy took one look and said oh iblis you know which is that arabic um Islamic kind of devil, if you like. There were Iblis seems to follow me everywhere as I look at the scene. You know, there's sort of devils all in this building. Uh, and I said, well, it, the, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> but the second, second the Dekan, yeah, he's kind of, kind of serpent headed creature, you know, and it does. And sometimes you get serpents sort of standing on the, on their tails and multiple st serpents knotted together. And all sorts of images that are kind of quite spooky, really. And a, a good place to see the images of the Deccans as actual images. Uh, and you can check these online as well or look at my pictures. Been lucky enough to photograph quite a lot of these sort of things. Uh, the Temple of Hathor at Dendera, which is one of the most wonderful surviving temples of ancient Egypt uh, that you can go and visit. Um, this has famously many, many astrological ceilings and monuments, some of which are still there. Some of them were the, one of the famous one of the circular zodiac of uh, Dendera is actually in Paris now. Uh, and I think they've got a copy of it in the temple itself. Napoleon's people actually took hacked it off the wall and took it to their museum in in France. But there are many, many uh, other interesting monuments there. Uh, and you can see this procession of these demonic creatures and you can follow the direction and you can you can see what they're getting. And each one of them will come at a particular time, either at your birth or in the course of your life. And it will have a, a, an influence on you, you, and you have to think about that. You have to think about what, what it's doing. Hathor, the temple of Hathor, uh, the goddess Hathor is, she is particularly associated with, um, birth omens and fate and, and all the rest of it. She really does have a dark side. She actually has a, a group of emissaries called the flower cutters that she sends out to when your time is up so when you're born you have this uh kind of in egypt in ancient egypt when you were born someone would work out who, who you know certainly it was thought the goddess hathor would kind of say well you know you're going to live that this amount of time and you're you're going to die in a violent way or you're going to die in your bed or you're going to drink yourself to death all these sort of things come up and it's going to happen on this day and that and this particular day and um 
And when the time comes, she'll send one of her emissaries, who are called flower cutters, and you're the flower, and they will come and they will take you. Um, and that would be the, the end of it, it but uh, an awful, awful lot of magic in Egypt uh, and a lot of this decanal stuff is to do with um, how to avoid it, <laughs> how to write your, write your, rub your name out from the book or something, uh, which in a sense is how to decondition yourself so you're not affected by these forces. Anyway, do check out the Temple of Hathor at Dendra and uh, if you're lucky you'll, you'll see some of these images. As they say, the decans in the tarot are ascribed to the small unnumbered cards between 2 and 10. The interesting thing about this, how they... One of the most popular tarot decks... Probably the two most popular tarot decks, I think, even now in the world, and there are lots of good ones, is still the Rider Waite tarot deck. Uh, made by Arthur Waite and uh, Pamela Coleman-Smith, and they call it the Rider Waite because of the publisher. Um, and obviously the Alistair Crowley deck. Whatever you think about Alistair Crowley, the tarot deck is hugely popular. It's such a good deck uh, and copied in lots of ways. Even if the new decks, they all kind of take certain things from this. Pamela Coleman-Smith and Arthur Waite, what happened was... As I said, the, the the Solar Busker deck is a very, very rare deck. I don't think you're going to find it hard to see it. You'll see reproductions of it now. Uh, but the actual deck itself is incredibly uh, rare, and uh, I don't think it was even available. And in 1907, the British Museum in London acquired a rare set of photographs. They didn't even get the deck. They just got a set of photographs, which was big enough deal because it's quite difficult even to get a photograph of this deck immediately realizing this is an important thing because this is a kind of wherever you think about the tarot just on the level of art as a renaissance piece of art this is an amazing uh, major sort of thing quite something so they thought they're going to have a special exhibition and they exhibit the, these things 1907 and sure enough, Pamela Coleman Smith and Arthur White wait, made a beeline for the exhibition. They saw these images. Uh, they took. They, they obviously took notes on it. And if you compare uh, the cards, something like the, the Three of Swords, for instance, um, of the Rider Waite Tarot with the Solar Busker uh, Three of Swords, the the similarity is unmistakable. Which is the Big innovation in modern tarot with the Rider Waite deck is that the small cards uh, are, have actually got stories on them. Whereas if you look at something like the, like the Marseille tarot, uh, the small cards are, are just, you know, ten of swords is just add another sword. It's just a picture of swords. There's, there's no story. It looks, they all look pretty similar. Uh, you can't really, it's very difficult to interpret from the uh, Marseille Tarot. Whereas the Rider Waite and uh, the Crowley Tarot, it tells you a story. It tells you what the meaning is, and you can interpret these stories. And that idea is copied from the Solar Busker uh, Tarot, and you can see that with some variations. And there is also there are also a set of interpretations of what those cards mean in terms of the decans, what those uh what what is the meaning of that card and the meaning is is taken from these traditional texts of of the decans uh, which is a lot to choose from you can see it with the uh the ten of swords if you compare the ten of swords but you have to compare it with something like the ten of clubs in the solar busca it's pretty much exactly the same uh, with some notable changes because the solar busker has a, some very odd features of its own right it's full of alchemical imagery uh, and it's also full of i don't know it, almost like uh, illnesses <laughs> a strange thing that might say, sound a weird uh, idea but the, but if you think about it, in terms of astrology or the, certainly in decans one of the more important aspects of the of the decans is to 
is is to do with illnesses. This is a kind of medical system. It's a way of predicting uh, what illness people might be uh, susceptible to in their life. The, so that when we say demons, sometimes demons are kind of it's like, it operates like a medical system. The demons are disease entities. They the so you get a whole uh, system of medicine there really, where it, it says oh this particular entity causes that particular disease. It's, it's like a traditional medical system in 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 the decans, which is funny enough, aspects of it are still functioning today in uh, in modern Egypt, just about. Uh, but that's again another fascinating story. Uh, just can't go into there, but. It is strange thing that in the solar busca, a lot of the figures of the Decanor images are they're, 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 they look a little bit deranged in a way. You know, they may they may be they may be sort of disabled, or they may be injured in some way, uh, or their clothes might be torn. They might not have any shoes. They may may look um, as if they're ill. I think if you, I'll, I'll read you an example, right, to sort of bring this bring this to life, if you like. If you look at the card, the three of, of clubs in the Solar Busca deck, um, so there's a lot of examples of this, so I'm going to just give you a little taster. Now, the, the figure, the figure, I, I think it looks as if it's, it's, it's quite a cruel image. It, it does look as though it's someone's really suffering. This image is also alchemical, I know, but but they do look as if they're they're suffering. They're, su they're, not, they're suffering from, I think, a migraine or something. By the look of it, one of the decanal te uh, texts that I looked at in some detail is called the Testament of Solomon. That's the Testament of Solomon, not to be confused with the Key of Solomon. The Testament of Solomon is a very very old book. Uh, it's a, a late period magical text, probably comes from Egypt. It certainly has lots and lots of Egyptian material in it. Uh, it has spells and all of this sort of kind of stuff, uh, which you can trace directly to the Egyptian magical uh, textbooks and formularies. You know, it's so obvious a connection. Even if you change the names to a different culture, the underlying stuff is uh meaning is there so from the testament of solomon the meaning of this card is i am called uh basafael so it's like a hebrew name in this case i cause those who are subject to my hour to feel the pain of migraine uh and if you look at the solar bus of cars, right, well being too, this is very typical. It kind of does look at kind of like someone suffering from some, uh, certainly from a headache. Uh, the use of things, these de demons, they're kind of quite useful in their way. They often tell you these things and then they tell you how to solve it. This is so that they've got a benign aspect, they're, they're giving you information. Uh, and it says, if only I, all you have to do, if I only hear the words Gabriel in prison for Safael, then it goes away. I, I, I retreat. The headache goes. So you get cause and solution. That's why I say a medical thing. Okay, so now, so there's two, two elements that we've dealt with, you know, really. Uh, I think I've kind of already shown right the extent of the Egyptian uh, background to the to, to the tarot history, uh, how much is there. If you know how where to look and if you know what what if you know something about you have to know something about Egypt as well and about what what that's like. So now we've got this new piece of information to sort of make it even the icing on the cake, if you like, which is a new book. Coming from the uh, Islamic tradition, um, in the ancient world was this figure called Zosimus. Uh, Zosimus usually is said to be the first alchemist. Yeah, Zosimus is the first Greek alchemist. Zosimus is the first Greek alphabet, uh, alpha, 
alchemist. I read that in this scholarly text. And I thought, yeah, but Zosimus, he lived in Egypt. Um, all right, he spoke Greek or he wrote in Greek. But he was also a priest. He was a priest in the Egyptian temple of, at Akmin, that name of it again. Um, and he, he wasn't just a sort of incidental priest. He was a really important priest. He kind of uh, was a techne. He knew technical stuff. Uh, he knew how to make all the colors that they used in Egyptian temples. Uh, he, he could make dyes. He could dye fabrics. He could paint things. He could paint the walls. He could produce the paint that they used to paint these incredible designs on the walls and everything. Very kind of close to the sort of stuff we're, we're, we're looking at, really. Color therapy, color theory, color theory, uh, dyeing physical substance that's so close to the esoteric ideas of the tarot it's all about color and color theory and manipulating color and that's such an important part of it the temple at akmin is not survived unfortunately otherwise we could really sort this issue out because we could go there and we could look but it's gone it's been destroyed um from the name, it must have been sacred to the god Min, who's always shown with an erection, a one of the oldest deities in the world. Right? One of the oldest deities ever uh, is is this god Min. He's really, really ancient. Uh, if you come to Oxford, you can go to the Ashmolean and you can see these very, very old statues. And it's the oldest thing that they've got in the museum. It's the oldest statue you'll find anywhere is of the god Min, incredibly important. Probably the god Thoth, by the sound of it, was also worshipped in the same temple. As I say, Zosimus was a specialist in making uh, materials, but he was obviously interested in alchemy. He's seen as the... Well, I w normally would have said he's the father of... Um, of of uh, the alchemical tradition but actually this new book that's been discovered uh, which is uh, one of his books is actually his book most of his books had been lost uh, but a book called the uh, book of pictures uh, which was known about but had not survived was just uh, in 2011 a copy was found in Istanbul and what has been translated uh, an Arabist translator uh, with an Egyptologist, an incredible cultural moment in, in lots of ways in terms of the history of, of alchemy and of magic and all the rest. And what, one of the things you discover from that is that Zosimus wasn't alone. He didn't put this whole thing together. He had a initially a student, uh, a woman, Thea Sabia, um, who were, he called his queen. Think of that again. He, he called, she wasn't actually uh, an aristocrat. She may have been, but it's more symbolic things. She's his queen. Uh, he is her king. King, queen. You kind of think about these images within the tarot now, the significance. Re initially, she, she, uh, she's very wealthy. She takes him on as a, to teach her the mysteries. Uh, but eventually, they... As she learns, they become collaborators. Uh, and there's something about their relationship. Uh, there's a lot of, they don't actually live in the same place. The, the, so there's all through correspondence mostly. I don't think they ever met. There's a kind of lot of love. There's love there, emotion, sexuality, but unrequited, sublimated. Something very, we'd say very tantric really, in, in their relationship, how they're using the power of love to penetrate the mysteries. And that that is, for a lot of people, what alchemy is. Uh, there are different interpretations of alchemy, but certainly their sort of alchemy is much more psycho psychophysical. It's partly physical, but it's about a kind of psychological changes. You do physical things, you make things, you make perfumes, you make colors, you make potions. But primarily it's what's happening in your psychology and in your dreams. That is where the alchemy, the real transformation takes place. Uh, and they are the, together, 
they create that entire tradition. Um, now, it wasn't really known this, but the, the weird thing is, after this incredible relationship between them at some point, she says, look, it's kind of a bit, a bit hard work, this. <laughs> you know, you're too clever, really. Uh, and, you know, you talk in riddles even now. Uh, can you can I find another way, right, of explaining all this to me? And she, she says, oh, I'll tell you what. Um, I'll, I'll draw a picture. <laughs> in fact, he... he he said, here's upon the idea, I'll draw a series of pictures for you uh, that will tell the entire story of how we transform, how we become immortal through these magical things that, uh, the, that are basically Egyptian tradition that's all around it. How, how we take this journey and, and change, how we, uh, in a sense, die and resurrect ourselves, but while we're still alive. Um, and he says, I'm going to split you in a series of pictures. And there's a surviving now, just been discovered, a series of 42 s images in a sequence that tell the story of alchemy and of psychological transformation. Uh, it was a rather extraordinary story. Uh, a huge book is going to take a long time to analyze it, but already looking at the pictures, when I discovered that there were actually pictures from Egypt that we could try and match up with the tarot. Would they match up to the tarot? That's the question. Uh, would they be, any, allowing for the fact that this is thousands of years ago and conventions of artistic conventions and uh, culture has changed quite a lot. So you know that things don't always look the same. I mean, you think that people show Egyptians in Roman armor and stuff like that. How is it gonna look? Um, As I say, that uh, one of the clues, right, that this was uh, to do with with that was he in the relationship. This obviously quite painful in a way, right, to to both of them. You know, this kind of because they they love each other, but they can't be together, and they're they've got a higher goal in sight. Maybe you could put it that way, or that's how it looks to them. So at one stage, several times, he, he says, you, "You're the." You're the equivalent of a, your body, right? Thinking about your body and your physicality is like a poison to me. Yeah, and he talks about the, the myth of the murderess of her husband. So the woman is remarkable as men and women as well. You know, you think about it, usually it's all the men telling these stories, was men and women telling the story. There's, there's something about your body that overwhelms me. Right, in terms of, and it's like a poison, and it, it and literally, it's gonna kind of kill me. I've got to be killed, uh, and then I'll come through the other end. She's gonna bring it through the other end, and and if you think, if you know anything about alchemy, that is that is the process: death, rebirth, through through this thing. So, again, in the solar busker, you'll see the dragons, you'll see the imagery, the images of the alchemy and the alchemical furnaces and the transformation. Uh, and the, I think about one of the cars, I'll just tell you about one of the cars, it was incredible, remarkable. The second card in the sequence is actually an image of the god Hermes or Thoth. Uh, Hermes, the Greek thing, Thoth, the Egyptian original of Hermes, put it that way. Second card in the in the major Trump series, if you get your tarot cards out, is uh, maybe the magician uh, or the conjurer, or if you've got a very esoteric deck, it will be Hermes, right? Or it will be Thoth if you use the Crowley deck. The second card is always Hermes. Hermes Thoth is their patron or their god god patron. There's an earthly patron as well from uh, from the spirit world who guides them. Thoth is the, is, is the one who's teaching them. They're trying to learn his mysteries. So Thoth is, 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 Thoth is there, he's shown with three heads, hence the term uh, thrice great Hermes, Hermes Trismegistos. He's shown, that is Hermes Trismegistos. He's shown in his right hand 
holding them, both of them, Zosimus and Seal Savior, the man and the woman, their bodies blood red. He's holding them by the hair in the in the in the uh, and then in the other hand he's holding the same two Zosimus and Theosavia before and after if you like. This is how you start red, this is how you finish white. That's the that's what's gonna happen to you. You're gonna be transformed, you're gonna be transfigured by the power of alchemy and imagery from one state to another. Incredibly remarkable image to see. Um, completely, if that isn't tarot, I don't, I don't really don't know what is. The other very, very common images, as there's 42 of them, incredibly rich images, as the tarot is. A tarot takes a long time to get your head around. Um, I talked about how there's this issue of when two people, men and women, or two people who where there's an emotional link between them, it could be two men, it could be two women, if there's that power of love there, possibility of love, how that can be painful, but also very transforming. Uh, if you if you know the secrets, that's the secrets of Eastern Tantra, of Eastern Alchemy, and all the rest is how to transform that very physical pain of uh, sexual love and of emotional, how to transform that into something religious, really, <laughs> or yeah, yogic or tantric or whatever. It's 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 the problem of uh, of spirituality in a, in a way and it's not new this is known about in the ancient world at one stage in the sequence you have uh, an image very like the hangman uh, image within the tarot where that in this case Zosimus is a is a corpse he's a hangman he's been actually killed in the process not completely killed but virtually almost dead and uh, Theosabia is holding his naked body I mean, these are kind of quite taboo images, and certainly now they're certainly taboo in the ancient world. Uh, certainly taboo in the ancient world. So he is he is he's born up. He's carried by Seosabia. Now, the remarkable thing about this image, apart from it being very like the hangman in the tarot, so it makes you think, what is the meaning of the hangman in the tarot? Uh, it's, a, it's about this, your physical death and resurrection in some ways, but in physical terms, in, in alchemical terms. Uh, it's, a, it's an alchemical mystery. The remarkable thing about the courts, then, it goes through this process of transformation in these pictures from the classical world, and there are serpents growing out of the body. There are serpents growing around it and protecting it uh, as it's being borne away by the uh, mourners, a group of mourners to be placed in the tomb, the re into the resurrection chamber. Incredible image. And this image has been discovered to be very very close it's the same image it's a copy of an image from an, from the uh, the sixth hour of the amduat uh from the tomb of seti the first in in egypt uh so the image that they're recurring so, so in a sense they're saying the whole sequence is is a is for them is their version of of the of a book that actually exists called the amduat was itself a secret book that was only uh, known to certain adepts and it was uh, painted on the walls of uh, Egyptian tombs. Uh, and if you go to the Valley of the Kings in, uh, in Egypt, you can see many, many beautiful versions of that. Although if you don't have a little bit of background on the Amdua, you can see the beauty of it, but you might not understand that. In a sense, that again is like a sequence of the tarot in its own way within a much more thoroughly Egyptian convention. But but that's the, the weird thing. So the image of the hangman, it kind of, re, it's, it's reminding us of 
In a sense, it's saying that the entire tarot sequence is a version of this Egyptian book, the Amduat. When the Amduat was, you see, Zosimus, he he, he lived very close to a, to a place called Abydos in Egypt, where there is this strange uh, chamber, like an alchemical chamber, which the archaeologists have discovered, which has been called the Resurrection Chamber. All sorts of strange mysteries took place there, which, uh, you know, you can read, I've written about that, but it's probably too much to go into in some details. Just know it's there. This Remember this thing that I'm Duarte? All the time, you see, we've got these links. We, it's not just peripheral, really. We're, we're kind of saying from this, or you can conclude from this, that this rather startling thing, really, that, that the tarot <coughs> not just has Egyptian the odd Egyptian image and a piece of iconography on it, it kind of is a version of this uh, ancient Egyptian, the, the core mystery of the Egyptian religion is come down to us. Our version of it, all right, a little bit corrupted and passed over the years, but it has come down to it. And maybe we need to start looking at uh, what is the meaning of the Amduat. That is what the tarot is for. Uh, to talk about to show us as I, this wouldn't be new that is showing us a life journey of, of the spiritual person really uh, and these different things that you might do not all in one time different mysteries you might explore but ultimately they all feed into this same journey from the fool if you like who is the first in the sequence the person who knows nothing or is thrown in at the deep end uh, to begin the journey, it's sometimes called the full journey even now. And through these series of initiations, because it, it's always a bit strange in a way for, for me, if you look at the series of the, the Tarot Trumps, that you start with the fool, and the, the first image is kind of quite a, of the magician. It's, it's quite a kind of complex image in a way. It's, it's almost like you go from nothing and suddenly you've got the whole mystery. But that's the God who is going to, whose mystery, who is going to guide you through the rest of the journey. You meet them first. Uh, so from comparing the two and uh, from reviving the Egyptian uh, Amduat, you discover again, right, a very, very deep mystery that lies behind the tarot, how significant it is uh, as a kind of revival of the, uh, the lost or cancelled Egyptian culture, how it's revived, uh, re returned. So I think that's probably what I've got to say on that for, for, for now. Uh, I think it's fair, I've established really that, that the, the tarot, maybe not as a piece of paper, as a, as a piece of cardboard or something like that, but as a kind of collection of images really does uh, have a, have a direct connection with the mysteries of ancient Egypt uh, and deserves our respect and, and love and is a, an incredible teaching aid to us uh, that we can take forward. So, thank you for listening. <laughs>